Hi, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Thank you again for joining the Climate Action Reserves webinar on the Climate Forward Program. I'm Amy Kessler, Forest Policy Manager at the Climate Action Reserve. I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping items before we get started. Currently, all participants are on mute. However, there will be a question and answer, answer session at the end of the webinar. We encourage participants to type their questions into the question box throughout the presentation. And we'll be keeping track of those questions and we'll do our best to answer them during the Q&A session. The webinar will be recorded and we will share the presentation and recording with the participants after the webinar. So without further ado, I'd like to present our speakers for the day, Craig Ebert, the President of the Climate Action Reserve, and Robert Lee, the Director of Programs at the Climate Action Reserve. Craig, the floor is yours. Thanks, Amy. I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. Uh, as you can see from uh, our, our title slide, we're here to announce uh, a new and innovative program that we've been working on the last couple of years that we're calling the Climate Forward Program. And the fundamental objective here is that this is a new market option to accelerate climate action. I did want to mention that all of you on today's webinar uh, were invited because you work in project development in one way, shape, or form. And we wanted to specifically reach out to you and talk about what this program is about and uh, uh, why we've designed it. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me get into, into the rest of the presentation. Next slide, please. I think most of you know who we are. Uh, our fundamental mission is that we are a nonprofit dedicated to market-based solutions to address climate change. Uh, we've been working on uh, uh, GHG accounting standards for, for many years right now and are perhaps best known as a, an offset uh, project registry here in, in California serving both the compliance and voluntary markets. And we uh, devised uh, uh, five and a half of the six uh, compliance protocols that were adopted by ARB for its uh, cap and trade program. But in addition to that, we've uh, worked with other jurisdictions, including uh, active down in Mexico with currently five uh, offset protocols developed in Mexico and have developed uh, a handful of offset protocols for Canada. For those of you familiar with that know that that's project's been on hold, but uh, uh, our mission is to develop the slate of offset protocols to be used across Canada as well. Having said that, that's not why we're here today. Uh, we wanted to talk about uh, the Climate Forward Program, which is uh, targeted at uh, not the compliance community, but essentially the rest of us that are contributing to climate change. I'll get into more details about that momentarily. Next slide, please. This is a, a message most of you are familiar with, but the uh, the, the globe on the side illustrates uh, the amount of warming that was detected from 1959 to 1988. Uh, and as we've seen since 1988, uh, there's been an acceleration in the rate of warming across the planet. Uh, the recent IP, P, IPCC report emphasizes that, frankly, humanity is virtually out of time to avoid dangerous uh, impacts on our global climate system. Uh, you can quarrel about the details, but uh, uh, those challenges are, are enormous and, uh, you know, the scientists are basically saying that by 2020, uh, two years from now, we need to have a global downturn in, in GHG emissions to keep it below one and a half degrees. We're a far cry from that. What is the IPCC telling us? One, the world is running out of time to address climate change. That we need more strategies and investment in climate mitigation. And the approach we're taking with the Climate Forward Program is that all future projects that increase GHG emissions should be carbon neutral. That is, uh, we all know that uh, there's a lot of discussion around uh, compliance companies uh, that are uh, wrapped up in a cap and trade program here in California or uh, uh, elsewhere potentially facing possibly a carbon tax or whatever, whatever the mitigation target is. That's uh, a very common approach to look at who the big emitters are and target them. But the reality of it is, is that uh, companies and organizations and all of us across the economy generate greenhouse gases every day. We're out of time. We need to increase ambition, need to accelerate action on climate change. And that's what Climate Forward is geared to do. We're targeting the rest of the economy that's uh, uh, producing emissions. And the fundamental objective here is that for any company or organization that is 
uh, investing in a new project that's generating greenhouse gas emissions, they should accept as part of their social responsibility uh, is mitigating those emissions. Next slide, please. Now, how does Climate Forward accelerate mitigation solutions? The basic approach we're, we're taking with this program, and again, as I mentioned, it's been under development for, for the past couple of years, and uh, we've recently exited a pilot phase, is that companies should be investing now to reduce emissions from projects and investments that they are, are taking into the future that will reduce emissions. So bottom line is we're looking at ex ante recognition of credits to address a future stream of expected emissions. You know, and, and uh, historically, I think our experience has been that we sort of wait until the emissions have happened and then we think about mitigating them. Uh, frankly, the world's out of time and uh, we believe that there's a wide variety of creative and innovative solutions in the market that can, uh, that can be brought to market. And that enormous potential is what we're targeting with Climate Forward. Uh, but companies will identify what those actions will be. And uh, unlike what we see in the offset world, we're not uh, with Climate Forward proposing a specific slate of methodologies and limiting it to that. From our perspective, the possible approaches to reducing emissions are virtually unlimited. There's a lot of ideas out there in, in the world about what those options can and should be. And we want uh, people to bring those uh, methodologies forward with the goal of climate forward, uh, as you'll uh, see momentarily, our objective is to uh, review those methodologies, uh, ensure that uh, they achieve the environmental integrity they're intended to do, and, uh, and launch projects uh, with a whole slate of, of methodologies. Uh, a lot of these ideas, frankly, come out of uh, local discussions around a, a new investment, uh, whatever that investment might be. And, and again, it runs the gamut from a whole variety of economic activity, from new manufacturing plant to a new retail center to perhaps a transportation project, a new headquarters, you name it. Uh, uh, those, all of those types of activities generate greenhouse gas emissions and they should be, be mitigated. Under this program, what are we, we are issuing is something that we're calling FMUs or forecasted mitigation units uh, that will uh, follow the reserve approved methodologies. Uh, and uh, each FMU is equivalent to one metric ton of anticipated CO2 reductions that is used to counter anticipated greenhouse gas emissions. And, and that's the forward looking nature of this program. Uh, we don't want to wait until those emissions get uh, actually created down the road. Uh, any new investments simply shouldn't be burdening the rest of us with the, the climate challenge. There's a lot going on right now, and uh, companies should not be further adding to the em emissions uh, reduction requirements of existing programs. Uh, we will be tracking the FMUs in a publicly accessible database, uh, much like we do in the, uh, on an offset registry. We want these project activities to be very transparent and clearly documented. Now, who's essentially our audience for Climate Forward? Well, obviously, it starts with uh, all of you on, on the call today. Uh, but as I mentioned, that that's a, 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 a slice, but a very important slice of, of, of the market. Uh, our you know, project developers understand what project development is all about. Uh, but just to be very clear, who should be uh, investing in the Climate Forward program? Any company or any organization that's making a new investment that's creating greenhouse gases. There's a whole uh, list of possible examples on the right-hand uh, part of the slide. Um, I'll just you know, use as one example, you know, if you're a company that's uh, creating a new uh, major building in New York or, or Washington or pick the location, that's gonna be uh, increasing greenhouse gas emissions. What are, are you as a company going to do about it? Uh, and we're creating this, this, this program to uh, allow any innovative strategies that a company might want uh, come up with to mitigate those emissions. Want to make it very clear that Climate Forward is not appropriate for addressing current emissions in a, in a compliance program. That is a cap and trade program, for example. That's a well-established uh, 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 approach out there for doing that through the use of allowances and offsets. And Climate Forward is not 
competing in that space at all. It's uh, extending beyond that and augmenting climate mitigation by targeting other activities in, in the economy. Furthermore, it's not appropriate for any company or an organization to use uh, you know, climate forward for mitigating historical emissions. In other words, you cannot mitigate past emissions with future actions. For those of you who remember, it's not, not like uh, the old notion, uh, I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. No, if you're emitting, uh, have already emitted greenhouse gases, the more appropriate approach to that would be uh, using something like offsets rather than saying, all right, I'll invest in something now that might generate emission reductions down the road, even though I've already created that emission. So again, this is very forward looking, uh, looking at uh, what a future stream of emissions will be and, uh, and making sure that we avoid those additional atmospheric loadings of GHGs. Next slide. What are the basic components of this? Well, first of all, a, a key uh, and, and a critical first component is actually developing the, the, the methodologies. Uh, we are open to methodologies that could be developed by any interested parties. What's an interested party? Anybody that's uh, creating additional greenhouse gas emissions. That's just a fact of life that a lot of economic investments, you know, create those impacts. And uh, as we all know, there, there's discussions that happen at uh, more of the local level around any project about how to mitigate the impacts of a project. Uh, we here at the Climate Action Reserve are not here to tell you what those specific actions might be. It, it could run the gamut from um, in, investing in local energy efficiency projects of any sort to uh, uh, you know, perhaps in, in more underserved communities. It could be a, a, a a forestry related project in, in a community. Uh, it could be an investment on the other side of the planet that a, a, you know, a community agrees it makes sense. You know, again, we're not here to pass judgment on where the reductions in greenhouse gases should occur. That is often an outgrowth of uh, local discussions on any investment. But once that investment is made, our position is, is that uh, the increase in emissions resulting from that project should be mitigated and we're here to ensure that there's a high level of environmental integrity behind those mitigation actions. In doing so, uh, we will be uh, rigorously and conservatively estimating those reductions on an ex ante basis. And I'm gonna get to the, the concept of conservativeness uh, shortly, uh, but we, we wanna ensure that the future performance of the mitigation projects meets expectations. Uh, Having said that this is an ex ante accreditation program, this has got to have meat on the bone to it moving forward. And by that, we want to see the investment happen. We want to see it up and operating and operating as expected. And again, more on that to come. Methodology should have broad geographic applicability. What do we mean by that? Well, frankly, uh, there should be it, unless there's a good reason for it, no geographic restrictions on the use of a methodology. It should work as well in uh, uh, Ontario as it does in Bangkok, because a ton reduction anywhere on the planet benefits the, the global environment and benefits all of us. So, uh, you know, we're not, uh, don't have a geographic preference for a given activity. The company might, and or its stakeholders in, in a local community might have a geographic preference, but that's for them to decide, not for us. Once we get that uh, uh, wide generic uh, methodology uh, reviewed and approved by the reserve, then projects can be developed around that methodology. And, and that's obviously ultimately the goal is to get a, a, a methodology approved that has a high level of environmental rigor to it and then a project gets developed uh, applied to that methodology to uh, mitigate greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Uh, you know, on the right hand side, there's a variety of, of, of objectives there that we have for uh, the public registry. Uh, I think uh, as you review that, you'll notice that uh, there's, there's a lot of components to ensure that we are going to get the reductions that, that are claimed. Um, and, and that'll be uh, fundamentally important uh, moving forward. Next slide, please. I mentioned that we were going to be do, uh, focusing on uh, conservative quantification. You know, what does that really mean? It's very important here that any 
recognition of emission reductions be done in a uh, conservative fashion by not overly recognizing the quantity of credits that are likely to come out, out of it. We think that's the way to assure the environmental integrity of the program. It's the way to uh, assure that any company or organization investing in a mitigation project uh, gets credit for, frankly, doing the right thing and not being unduly chastised for being overly aggressive about the quantity of credits that they're, they're, uh, they're uh, being accredited for. I think you've all seen these concepts, most of them anyway, of real additional permanent, confirmable and enforceable, perhaps not confirmable. What do we mean by that? Uh, in the offset world, we all talk about the concept of verification. We are not uh, requiring uh, ongoing uh, ex post monitoring and verification in this program. We do allow for it. And again, we'll uh, talk about that in, in, in more detail uh, in a moment, but what we're, uh, anticipating here is what we call a, a confirmable activity. As I said earlier, what do we mean by that? Uh, we have, uh, the program is structured to train confirmation bodies to go out and confirm that the stated project that a company is investing in was built, is operating as, as, as they said, and is operating as expected. It is only after that confirmation report that we will recognize that there's valid emission reductions there, that valid FMUs or forecasted mitigation units uh, will be assigned. And again, that's not only for the overall environmental integrity of this program, but it's for the protection of everyone involved in this program. The bottom line is, is the world needs uh, further action now. Actually, we needed it yesterday. And it's only by uh, aggressive mitigation actions moving forward that we're going to have any hope of uh, trying to limit uh, warming to uh, under two degrees, ideally under 1.5. So I, I'm going to uh, stop there at this moment and turn it over to Rob Lee, our director of programs, to walk you through some of the mechanics of the program. And I, again, I just wanted to also remind uh, all the participants that if you have any questions based on this, feel free to put them in the, uh, the chat box and we'll address them at the, uh, the end of the presentation. Rob, over to you. Uh, thanks, Greg. Um, so what does co conservative quantification mean um, at, with respect to this program? Um, what we're talking about with uh, conservative quantification is that we want to make sure that any credits that we issue on an ex-ante basis will uh, will be conservatively quantified and conservatively issued. Um, to, to that end, we have introduced a number of mechanics into the program to ensure that the program, uh, the, the program um, is assured of this uh, conservative quantification. The first uh, step in ensuring conservative quantification is that all methodologies are required to account for uh, a number of risks that uh, we have identified as um, you know, unique to ex-ante crediting programs. So, uh, we, we want all methodologies to account for the risk that reductions will not be achieved as they've been forecasted. And uh, in line with this, we want those uh, methodologies to have specific uh, quantified deductions for uh, expected performance decline in whatever the project is, and to account for the risk that the project might be uh, completely abandoned as well. On top of these deductions to uh, the crediting um, we also require all methodologies to uh, propose what we're referring to as an ex-ante risk pool. So projects are required to uh, leave some credits on the table and contribute those credits to a project-specific risk pool that can be um, clawed back in the future or, if not clawed back, go towards assuring the uh, environmental integrity of the program as a whole. Next slide. So there are two pathways for project development under Climate Forward. Um, in scenario A uh, at the top here, when there is no applicable methodology developed for a project type yet, uh, the methodology first needs to be developed and approved before a project can be implemented and issued FMUs. Um, in scenario B at the bottom, a project proponent who wants to develop a project has identified that uh, there is an existing approved methodology that they would like to use and 
can implement the project using that uh, pre-existing approved methodology. Next slide. So how does a methodology actually get developed and approved? Uh, the first step in the methodology development and approval process is for a methodology developer to submit a forecast methodology concepts to the reserve. Um, upon submission, uh, we will review that methodology for adherence to program standards and principles, um, put, possibly consult with external technical experts if, if necessary, um, meaning if the methodology is within a sector that we feel like we don't have um, appropriate uh, technical expertise in, we will consult with a, a technical expert um, who does have that expertise. Uh, we will consolidate our findings and um, provide those findings back to the methodology developer uh, and require the methodology developer to review the findings and revise the methodology accordingly. Um, this phase of the process is an iterative process, so um, you know it might go through multiple uh, review iterations. Uh, once we find that the methodology is at a state where we are comfortable with it, we will post that methodology for a public comment um, and uh, prov provide the public with an opportunity to review and comment on the methodology uh, before we will approve that methodology and allow projects to be submitted uh, under it. Next slide. <clears throat> Once projects uh, have been submitted and implemented, um, all projects are required to undergo uh, confirmation. As Craig mentioned, um, we're introducing confirmation as kind of a new concept, um, and it differs significantly from verification, from you know, the ex post verification that most of us are familiar with. Uh, confirmation is a one-time confirmation of the project's implementation at an appropriate time in uh, at appropriate time after the project start date uh, and what the confirmation body would uh, does during confirmation is ensure that the project has been implemented uh, in accordance with the rules requirements and uh, quantification methodologies established by an applicable approved methodology uh, Entities that are eligible to perform confirmation um, are required to have third-party accreditation through an IAF body, um, and then also uh, must undergo uh, specific reserve trainings uh, related to this program and other, uh, other requirements as well. Um, similar to verification, uh, the confirmation body also has to, to conduct conflict of interest assessments to ensure that uh, their confirmation of the project uh, is not uh, burdened by a conflict of interest. Um, all methodologies uh, are required to identify what we're calling project resilience measures. Um, project resilience measures address the risks of projects not achieving the greenhouse gas reductions that um, are anticipated to be achieved on that ex ante basis. Um, implementation of these project resiliency measures um, are also required to be confirmed by that confirmation body through the confirmation process. FMUs are only issued subject to a successful confirmation. So next slide, please. So credit issuance under this program takes the form in really a few options for crediting. Um, the first option, or well, the first uh, what we're calling stage one here is really the core of this program, and it's the fundamental issuance option that uh, serves as the backbone of Climate Forward and really uh, why we developed the program in the first place. Um, so stage one is a one-time issuance of forecasted mitigation units following that successful confirmation, uh, which allows developers to invest in the implementation of a project, implement the project according to um, an approved forecast methodology, and get that project confirmed and then be able to walk away from the project if they so choose. Stages two and three are voluntary options. And I wanna really emphasize that stages two and three are purely voluntary options, um, but they were created in order to try to provide a financial incentive for projects that uh, may actually be generating more emissions reductions than initially accredited uh, due to those conservative quantification um, mechanics that we've uh, built into the program, 
to perform ongoing monitoring, reporting, and verification so that they can be issued the credits that they may have left on the table based on that conservative forecasting. And then stage three is um, another kind of flexibility option that we've built into the program that allows projects to, after the initial uh, ex ante crediting period, um, demonstrate that there's actually still emission reductions uh, being generated by the project and they can then transition the project into uh, an ex post monitoring, reporting and verification uh, framework to be issued uh, additional credits. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, in this slide, I'm trying to we're, we're trying to demonstrate exactly the how those uh, those different stages of credit issuance work. Um, so in this slide, we're demonstrating the initial two stages of FMU issuance. Um, so I mean, if you could uh, click, yeah. In stage one, um, which again is the core of this program, uh, the project is implemented. Confirmation activities occur at a point in time after that uh, implementation. And upon successful confirmation of the project's been implemented in accordance with that uh, forecast methodology, FMUs for the entire crediting period are issued uh, based upon that conservative uh, forecasting. In stage two, uh, which again, I want to emphasize is purely an optional, uh, is purely a voluntary option. Um, the project proponent has realized that because of the conservative quantification of the program, there's additional emission reductions that the project achieves uh, that will be left on the table. And so they opt in to the optional ongoing monitoring reporting and at, a ver at a frequency that's uh, determined by the forecast methodology and conduct a single ex post verification of all the data that they've been submitting throughout the crediting period at the end of the crediting period. So upon the conclusion of the crediting period, there's that single verification of all of the monitoring data that they've been reporting. And if uh, they're able to successfully verify all of that data, uh, additional FMUs can be issued to the project. Next slide. So after the initial crediting period expires, uh, projects have the option to opt into what, we're refer what we, we referred to um, in the previous slides as stage three. So here uh, we see stages one and two again. And then once that initial crediting period has expired, uh, the projects that, projects that opted into stage two uh, are eligible to transition the project into ongoing uh, MRV and ongoing issuance of FMUs resulting from uh, successful periodic verifications. Uh, again, just to emphasize that point, uh, projects are only eligible to opt into stage three um, if they were able to be successfully verified in that stage two um, option. Uh, the MRV requirements and frequencies under uh, stage three are going to be established on a methodology by methodology basis. Next slide, please. So how can you participate in Climate Forward? I think the first step would be to review the program documents that are now available online um, at the URL on this slide. Uh, so these documents include the Climate Forward Program Manual, the Climate Forward Confirmation Manual, and the Forecast Methodology Approval Manual. Um, and those documents uh, detail all of the principles and standards that uh, methodologies and projects and confirmation have to uh, up, uh, uphold um, in order to participate in the program. You can also sign up for the Reserve's monthly newsletter to ensure that you're up to date on all Climate Forward news. And you can uh, develop and submit innovative methodologies for use in the Climate Forward program and invest in and develop projects that use uh, approved forecast methodologies. Uh, thank you all for your interest in Climate Forward. Um, we're really excited about the prospects and opportunities that this program can facilitate. And um, at this time, I'll turn it up back over to Craig. Thanks, Rob. Uh, just want to remind everyone that uh, if you want to ask a question, there is the, the question box there. We've already had a few posts, and I'll get to them in a moment here, but I just want to encourage uh, anyone who's got something on their mind to feel free to add to the list. Um, 
got a lot of really good questions here, and let me just uh, dive right into it. Uh, one question, can the reductions that generate FMUs in, occur in sectors that are capped by cap and trade programs? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we've had a, a lot of discussion around this, but again, keep in mind the, uh, the objective of the program is to be open for any innovative and creative reduction option that achieves real reductions to be applied against a future stream of emissions. And if uh, a company decides that it's uh, uh, worthwhile to make that reduction in a cap sector, uh, like they might here in California, that's fine. Let me expand on that a little bit more because some people may be thinking, well, wait, is, is that really additional? The goal here is for the company not to shift the, uh, uh, the, uh, the supply or, uh, or, or the demand for to get down to the, the, the cap level. So all that the company is presumably trying to achieve uh, with, with a goal of carbon neutrality with, with an investment in FMUs is uh, just to use a simple example, if it's, it's looking at a new investment that's gonna be generating 100,000 tons of emissions in the future, it invests now in a project that will achieve 100,000 tons of reductions and basically mitigate the impact of that future investment. So what's the net change in the cap sector? Zero, that's the goal here, not to uh, uh, you know, further increase the burden on, on the citizens of, of uh, uh, of California or any other jurisdiction that uh, needs to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and, I, and I think you know th that's an important takeaway. That it, here in California is also backed up by ARB. Uh, the Air Resources Board has been very clear that uh, new projects should be mitigating the impacts of uh, of their investments and not further adding to the uh, requirements of, of, of the cap sectors. Um, I suspect that ARB will be uh, increasingly clear about that in in the months and years to come. But you know, this is not a get out of a jail free card where the rest of us can e emit greenhouse gases willy nilly and and leave it to the cap sectors to to achieve the reductions. Uh, <clears throat> another question: Can a company invest in FMUs to mitigate projected future scope three emissions? Is there allowed future time frame required? For example, could they invest in FMUs in 2019 for scope three emissions projected to occur in 2020? The basic answer to that question is, is yes. Uh, there is, we, we don't see any reason to limit investments now in activities that will mitigate future impacts. Um, and and, and uh, clearly uh, any company that's looking at a future stream of, uh, of, of emissions could invest now in what whatever it thinks it wants to invest in uh, to mitigate uh, you know those those future emissions. You know that's actually related to another question that we were we were asked here is that uh, you know uh, you know you know why uh, you know you know why use uh, F FMUs as as opposed to offsets? Again, absolutely nothing wrong with. Uh, uh, using uh, offsets in, in, in a lot of applications. What we're addressing here is the future uh, stream of economic activities that are further burdening, uh, uh, you know, all of us in the atmosphere with additional GHGs. Uh, and uh, the reality of it is, is while uh, a couple of other things is that, you know, one, we're not trying to compete with the existing offset market. And two, uh, as we all know, the types of projects allowed in the offset world for a whole variety of reasons are fairly limited. We understand that there are numerous innovative ideas out there that for whatever reasons, whether uh, you or I agree with it or not, do, do not make it into the offset world. And with Climate Forward, we wanna make sure that those uh, uh, innovative and creative ideas are, are unlocked and, uh, you know, we do, are, none of us can, can sit here right now and say exactly what ideas those might be. Uh, and I think that's, that's part of the, uh, 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 you know, one of the advantages of the program is, is to, uh, 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 you know, is, is to uh, un understand what, what those uh, future opportunities might be and invest in them now. 
you know, there's a specific question, what's the advantage for companies to invest in FMUs versus other verified assets? It's obviously a related question. I wanna be very clear about this. Again, there's nothing wrong with investing in assets, but for those of us who have worked with companies on, on their sustainability strategies or their you know, climate mitigation strategies in particular, the list of potential asset types out there is limiting. Uh, maybe they don't want to invest in a, uh, uh, a certain project type. Uh, I'm not, 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 you know, and again, there's nothing wrong with that, but, you know, companies have their own values. They have their own stakeholders that, uh, that they're facing. They have to go before their local uh, uh, community boards and regulatory approval authorities to, to get approval to, to do that new investment, whatever it might be. And there are just a lot of ideas that get thrown around about how to, to mitigate the impacts of that new investment. Here in California, as, as many of, of you know, we have a very vocal environmental justice uh, community that is uh, often talking about the need to invest more locally. Uh, and there are a lot of ideas around there that do not uh, lend themselves to offsets. So, you know, again, we're not here to dictate to those local stakeholders, what their specific actions should be. That's for those decisions to come out of those approval uh, uh, approvals and, and permits for any any given new investment. And a company can can decide themselves what that slate of, of uh, investment options might look like. Develop a methodology and develop a project uh, uh, in order to move forward. So that's what we're, we're hoping uh, will happen here. Uh, uh, this is as again, the overall objective here is there's a lot more cost effective mitigation out, out there. There's a lot more creative ideas that is currently represented in the offset world. And we are uh, on a forward looking basis are trying to recognize that those opportunities are, are there. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that's again, the goal of the program. Uh, yeah, once Craig, if I could jump in and, and you yeah. know in addition to really the uh, flexibility um, and kind of tailoring the, the project types to the demand side I think another you know large uh, potential for uh, the use of FMUs um, is that uh, for companies that want to uh, mitigate their greenhouse gases I think uh, Craig touched on this a little bit but this this program should be, uh, based on its ex ante uh, framework, a much more cost effective option for uh, mitigating and generating uh, mitigation units. Thanks, Rob. Another question that was asked uh, um, Assuming a project opts into stages two and three, are FMUs eligible to be converted to CRTs? Short answer is yes. I want to make a couple of points here. First of all, as Rob was saying, one of the reasons those stages are optional, there may be uh, companies out there that simply want to make that initial investment and walk away from it and say, all right, uh, we invested in X, Y, Z. We got the credits we needed and uh, we're not, cons you know, I don't want to worry about it. Uh, and frankly, that's fine. But you, you may recall that we stress the conservative nature of the estimation of FMU credits that would come out of this. Uh, a lot of uh, you know developers out there may look at a project and say, "All right, uh, you know, I think I'm going to generate 100,000 tons. You initially gave me an allocation of pick a number, 70,000 tons. I'm going to continue ongoing monitoring and verification." To, because I know I can earn at, at least at 30,000 additional tons, if not more. Those decisions are gonna crop up all the time and it's not for us to decide, you know, whether someone uh, should continue to invest in, in that area and do the ongoing, uh, uh, you know, monitoring that would be required to prove that uh, they deserve issuance of more credits than they were originally got, uh, originally received. We're hoping that the incentive in the program is to encourage uh, projects to, to do that ongoing uh, m and but uh, at the end of the day, th that, it, that will be up to, to each project developer. And in terms of being converted to CRTs, yeah, that's obviously down the road in the program and we've had a lot of discussion on that. Uh, I'll be honest with you, we haven't fully worked out the, uh, the requirements of what it would take to convert to CRTs, but we don't see any reason why. At, at the end of the day, uh, if you're uh, essentially, say, 10 years down the road following uh, the same 
M and V path that that you might for uh, an offset project, for example. Uh, we don't see any reason why not to allow that conversion. Now, whether it's worthwhile to do that or not, uh, we're going to leave that to, to others. But we do intend to have uh, have that pathway in the program. Uh, next question: Do you anticipate that FMUs could be used for CEQA offsets for AB 900 CEQA streamlining projects required offsets? Yes. Uh, Perhaps some details still to be worked out, but we've had discussions with a number of uh, uh, regulatory authorities around the state, and uh, you know, our, the initial feedback we're getting is that they're excited to see this program getting off the ground and, and opening up a new avenue for a mitigation investment. Uh, another great question. Have you consulted with CDP to determine if how they will allow FMUs to be counted in corporate disclosures? Uh, no, we have not, but we will. Uh, I think the takeaway here is that these are going to be credible uh, emission reductions uh, being applied against the future stream of emissions, and, and uh, we're structuring the program to make sure that uh, there's a, that high degree of credibility around the program. You know, furthermore, Rob mentioned the idea of the uh, the risk pool. Uh, at the end of the day, we actually expect to accomplish more reductions than FMUs that are issued, but we're also providing incentives to make sure that the project developers can recognize that. We certainly don't see any barriers whatsoever uh, uh, to recognizing that. Um, a few other questions. Will there, uh, will there be a separate account on, on, on the reserve required for FMU maintenance? Yes, there, you know, we're setting this up as essentially a, it's a completely separate registry from our offset registry. Uh, I won't go into the, the mechanics of setting up an account. Uh, you know, happy to have a further discussion on that, but we, we're definitely providing uh, avenues, uh, you know, for uh, for signing up and ma maintaining accounts on, on the program. Um, looking through some other questions here. Um, it sounds like FMU development is different than offset credits in that it's future GHG reductions, but the purchase is similar in that FMUs can be purchased to mitigate past or future emissions. Is that correct? Yes. I want to be clear that our main intent of the program is for investments to happen now to create a future stream of emission reductions to apply against the future stream of emissions from an investment. Um, but if um, you know, you, you know, if you wanted to invest, oh, excuse, I, I'm going to check my answer there. I just realized now that I'm re reading it, um, you cannot purchase FMUs to mitigate past emissions. Uh, I thought the question was originally asking, in anticipation of a future stream of emissions, you know, can you mitigate that uh, where you currently might be using offsets? And the answer to that is yes, but no. Um, if you're trying to mitigate past emissions, let's say like last year's carbon footprint for your, your company, uh, it's uh, not acceptable to say, uh, I'm gonna invest now to create a future stream of emission reductions that I'm gonna apply to last year's emissions. That is different, maybe very clear of saying, I know in 2025, I'm gonna be uh, generating emissions and I'm gonna, invest now in emission reduction opportunities that I will apply to my 2025 footprint. That's a different issue. And we, we certainly uh, uh, accept that type of activity under the Climate Forward program. There, interesting question here. Can a company invest in FMUs to mitigate projected future scope three emissions? Is there an allowed future time frame required for example, could they invest in FMUs in, in 2019 for scope three em emissions projected to occur in 2020? Um, the, the basic answer is, is, is yes. I th think I tried to uh, address that earlier, but I, I, you know, again, that, that's sort of the forward uh, uh, looking notion of, of the program. Give me a moment here just to scroll through the uh, various questions coming in. By the way, these are great questions. I, and, and while I'm looking at I, one point I want to emphasize to all of you is 
don't uh, take away from from uh, from this that we're trying to be overly restrictive on how the the mechanics of this program operate. Quite the contrary. Uh, the genesis for this was the recognition that there simply is not enough mitigation activity uh, happening uh, to address climate change. We have the compliance grade programs around allowance uh, allocations and offset creation. There's nothing wrong with that. We're targeting the rest of the economy that uh, should be doing more. And in many cases, we know that they want to do more. Uh, you know, there are a lot of companies out there that are, are trying to be aggressive on their uh, their actions on climate change. Uh, and I know from, from my experience working with many of them that they're often frustrated with what they think are the, the lack of tools in the tool belt. Uh, Climate Forward is designed to create uh, a wide variety of opportunities and to tap into a lot of that, that creativity at each company to decide what they think their mission is, who their stakeholders are, how they would like to be making the investments. And, you know, they can then bring those methodologies to us to make sure that uh, their investments are achieving the, the high degree of environmental uh, integrity that we all expect. Uh, there was one question here about, uh, you know, uh, you know, could we, that uh, someone has a client that that's uh, uh, generating additional GHGs associated with the construction of a new office building, you know, walk them through the steps of how the, how they would do the program. I, I'm going to give a general answer right now, uh, you know, because where we are in the program right now is, as I mentioned, we've been working on it for a couple of years. There are uh, a small handful of methodologies that we expect to have approved for the program moving forward. But I want to be very clear that, you know, this is not look on the reserves, see what methodologies are available, and I'm going to use one of those. That's clearly an option. What we are expecting is that because all of these decisions about uh, building a, a, a a new project often involve a lot of local give and take, that there will be a lot of new ideas coming out of that. And we're expecting methodologies to be brought to us uh, and, and then subsequently projects uh, that uh, respond to, to those methodologies. So it, it's, uh, I think that part of the answer back there is, you know, what does your client want to do um, and, and how do they want to do it? And then, you know, we can talk about, you know, yeah, you know, as Rob was showing, that the basic steps are in in the slide deck, which are, again we will be posting uh, online after after the webinar here. Uh, another question: It sounds like FMU development is different than offset credits in that it's future GHG reductions, but the purchase is similar. FMUs can be purchased to mitigate past or future emissions, and, and again, it's similar in a lot of ways. But again, you're not. Uh, purchasing FMUs to mitigate past emissions. The process, you know, once you get involved in it, has a lot of similarities, but again, this is forward-looking. You're investing now to create a future stream of uh, emission reductions to mitigate a future stream of, emis of emissions that you're creating by some type of investment. Is there detailed guidance on what needs to be included in the project methodology? Are there examples of already approved methods? Great question. Uh, Last, uh, one of the second to last page, I think, of, of the slide deck here had uh, in the, the link to our, our website. We have posted our method, uh, our program manual, um, our uh, the confirmation manual, and the methodology manual. Rob, did I get that right <laughs> before I go any further? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so. Uh, we definitely already have guidance documents for the program that provides more detail on it. Obviously, we didn't go into those details to the, to today. Um, on the issue, are there examples of already approved methods? Uh, you know, we are working on several methodologies that are an outgrowth of our pilot, and uh, those are not fully ready for, for prime time, but will be very shortly. Uh, but, but just to give you a, of an idea of some of the methodologies that we've been looking at, uh, some of them have been, you're familiar with more from uh, the cap and trade program. They're, they're forestry projects, they're dairy digester projects. A couple that you're not familiar with are energy efficiency or energy, you know, renewable energy programs uh, uh, in California. Those are clearly activities under a cap sector, but they're fabulous uh, for this program. Another one is, uh, 
uh, energy efficient cook stoves in, in, in Africa. And a lot of people uh, ask, why is, is that allowed? It goes back to what I was saying earlier. None of us from a climate perspective should care where the reductions happen. And some of you have heard me argue that uh, actually uh, all of us in the industrialized world have an obligation to help reduce emissions elsewhere because historically we've created this problem. And uh, I've certainly told uh, many people that it's not just sufficient for anybody just to get to, get to zero today. And that includes California. Uh, just as an aside, California, in my, in my est estimate, is about the, the 12th largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the history of mankind. And I would argue that it's not, not uh, uh, sufficient just to uh, uh, get to a, a zero emitting economy. Uh, California also has an obligation to assist others. And, and, and don't get me wrong, California obviously is doing a lot in that respect, but we recognize that uh, opportunity in the Climate Forward program as well. If there are um, interesting opportunities elsewhere on the planet that can create reductions, again, uh, we're going to leave that to the, uh, uh, the, the local or you know, the company itself and its, its local stakeholders to decide what was appropriate. In this case, uh, uh, that was something that uh, was already agreed to. Uh, it was not part of what we were involved in, but we are making sure that, it, that those investments are happening with a high degree of environmental credibility. Um, question here, what do you suggest as an approach for companies that have made initial investments in, in voluntary offsets who wish to proceed to FMUs? I would encourage you first, I'd, without knowing a little bit more detail, I'd, I'd frankly would rather have a, a sidebar conversation. Feel free to reach out and be love to, to talk to you more about that. Just to understand uh, what, what, the, uh, what your situation is. I do want to stress again that our goal here is is not to, uh, to compete in the offset market. We do recognize that for voluntary action, the, the, the state of play for the longest time have been voluntary offsets. We have a vibrant voluntary offset registry here at the reserve and we're certainly not trying to cannibalize that. What we are trying to do is just incentivize uh, additional action on climate change. And if, if your particular objective is to meet a, a, a future need, uh, perhaps uh, the Climate Forward program is is better tailored to your objective. But again, without knowing more, I, I don't want to jump to that conclusion. Realize we've got a few more minutes. Uh, someone was asking, what is the difference between Climate Forward and the CEQA GHG mitigation registries? Uh, someone's been paying attention. Uh, there's no difference. We originally were calling this the CEQA GHG mitigation registry uh, for the, for the subcomponent of the program here in California. And uh, you could probably all agree that the phrase CEQA GHG mitigation registry doesn't exactly roll off one's tongue. More to the point, CEQA is obviously the California Environmental Equality Act. This program is not just intended for California. It undoubtedly has applications under CEQA and, and here in California for a whole host of reasons. But I want to, be, you know, again, be, be very clear. Every any company or organization that's further adding to the uh, atmospheric loadings of greenhouse gas emissions should be taking action to mitigate that. And Climate Forward is is intended to target, uh, uh, you know, provide that opportunity for them to do so in what, whichever way, shape, or form they think is most appropriate. Um, what are the estimated costs associated with the F FMU registry and issuances? I'll refer that uh, actually online. We've got that published in, in the uh, online resources, uh, the, the, the schedule of, of fees, and uh, you know, happy to talk further about that. Um, Amy, could you go back to the slide with the web page so that everyone can see that? Great. Do you want to say anything else, Rob? Just make sure that they can see that. 
No, yeah. So if you if you have any questions on fees, um, the, the fee schedule is posted on that web page. Um, so you can uh, feel free to uh, view that at your leisure. OK. Time for a couple more questions. There's a, this one is, is actually a, a, a very good question. If projects do not opt into the later stages two and three, how are they monitored to ensure they are operating or are they? In other words, does conservative quantification remove need for monitoring? Uh, that's getting at a, a number of, of great questions. And as I said earlier, we uh, one of the, the criteria for considering a methodology and subsequent projects under that methodology is what's the likelihood that a project would continue once it's confirmed. Like, for example, if, if one goes to the expense of buying PV panels, installing them on a roof, making sure they're up and operating and reducing one's electrical bill, what's the likelihood that someone's going to walk away from that investment even if they choose not to do ongoing monitoring and verification? We would argue very low. Uh, you know, does it completely eliminate the, the need for uh, or concern over uh, what might happen in the future? No, it does not. That's one of the reasons why uh, we're uh, very conservative in the initial issuance of FMUs. Uh, as Rob was saying, there are a number of criteria that uh, a methodology needs to consider, which includes the likelihood that a project could uh, degrade in performance and or be abandoned. So we're trying to address that up front. For any given project, though, there's still a possibility that for whatever reasons, there may be a downstream failure. We think from uh, the incentives that we provided in, in the optional stage two and three that even if a company might want to walk away, there is going to be economic value uh, on the table there. And the project developer uh, and or landowner, whoever it might be, will have an ongoing interest in, in doing that. But it may not happen. But certainly through the program, we are trying to provide that incentive for additional reductions to occur. The other thing we're doing, as I mentioned, is through the conservative uh, initial issuance of credits that there will indeed be additional uh, credits left on the table. We know that. And uh, uh, e each project is essentially contributing into uh, a broader risk pool. Uh, so you can think of it uh, as an opportunity for that project moving forward to to uh, down, you know, in the future to to uh, claw back some of those uh, additional credits. Uh, but again, that's not mandatory, but they will still sit in the risk pool. That risk pool will definitely grow over time. I think it's also important to understand that the ultimate uh, incentive here. Many companies taking actions here are going to be doing so on a voluntary basis, and uh, you know they they certainly have every incentive to make sure that the projects are uh, built properly and invested in and 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 maintained. They may choose not to do that, but you know there's there, there's uh, we we don't see very little uh, opportunity or, or rationale for gaming here. Uh, you know, if a company is going to be, frankly, putting up what, what will often be a, a, a considerable investment amount to get a, a, a viable project going, uh, you know, walking away from it uh, typically is, isn't a uh, uh, something that's going to happen. But as I mentioned at, at you know uh, uh, earlier, we structured the program to make sure that there's a risk pool to to account for that, uh, the possibility of project underperformance or, or abandonment even. Um, we are at the top of the hour. I, I know there are some other questions. You know, I, feel free to reach out to us for further discussion. We will be having additional webinars uh, to reach out to a, a, a much wider uh, community. As I said, this was focused today on project developers, just to since you folks are, have a lot of experience working in the mitigation market. Um, we hope you've, you found this uh, uh, helpful, and uh, we will post uh, this. Uh, uh, webinar on our website uh, very shortly. So again, thank you very much for attending. Stay tuned and uh, we look forward to working together on Climate Forward. Take care.